Hey everybody, welcome to the Nicecast. I'm your host, Matt. I'm Nate. And I'm Drew. Uh, take two. <laughs> All right. <laughs> so, uh, welcome to Linux Cast. We are a podcast, ironically enough, about Linux. It's right there in the title. And tonight we have something special for you. I feel like I've already said all of this before because I actually have. <laughs> I can't help it. But anyways, we have something special. We, we have decided that we're going to review Nobara Linux. We talked about this several months ago. And we planned on it for uh, episode 830. This is episode 830. I'm very proud of us because normally when we say we're going to do something, we do it eventually. It's never really when we say we're going to do it. But this time, we stuck to our guns. It's episode 830, and we're going to review Nubar Linux. But before we jump into that, we're going to go around the horn and talk about what we've done this week in Linux. So, Drew... For real this time, <laughs> what you been up to on Linux? Let me reread what I already wrote. <laughs> <laughs> Scroll back to the top, man. <laughs> yeah. This past week has been quite an exploration for me. I've been delving deep into the world of dedicated servers and examining various options and configurations to find the best fit for the needs of the podcast and for the group that you see before you. In particular, I've been focusing on Jitsi, and which has proven to be quite challenging when it comes to modifying configurations. And the learning curve is steep, but it's been rewarding to grasp some of the intricacies involved. Additionally, I've been immersing myself in Nextcloud and uncovering just how extensible and versatile it is. It's even more so, guys. The more I learn and the more I appreciate its capabilities and the potential uh, application that it can bring to you or a group of people. And it's been a nonstop journey. And I'm, I'm kind of excited actually to see where, what I've been gathering as far as knowledge is concerned will, will like lead me. And clearly I, uh, I own the fact that I have not done the video that I said that I was gonna do last week. I have one resolution to get on the server that uh, I just, I just got, and if I can get that squared away, I will do the video that I said that I was going to do. So with that said, that was my week in Linux. Yeah, if you don't make a video pretty soon, we're all going to think you forgot your password, Drew. Just, <sighs> yeah, just, no, just that's fair. It. It's fair. <laughs> it also happens. You get into other projects, and it just, you know... You gotta do. You gotta do the things you gotta do. All right. So Nate, what about you, man? What you doing this week in Foss? So I've actually been working in Arch, funny enough. And as you can see behind me is my Lenovo ThinkPad, and I finally got CUDA working properly on this. Now, if I can get OpenGL to be nice, that would be great. But it's a slow process of getting there. And the reason why I plan on trying to use it because it, it is a ThinkPad. You know, it just Arch feels natural for it feels like home and also i have been trying to set up my own next cloud instance to be able to kind of share files and do more things myself limitation i'm running into is actual server hardware i don't have i don't have enough hardware to <laughs> properly host what i need so that just gonna be on my list of already too many things that my wife says i have too much already so so she, is she going to ask you to trade in a monitor if you want a new computer? She's already told me that I need to sell two monitors and a computer and a keyboard and a mouse before I can bring something else in. So we're going to have a hard day one of these days. Uh, there's going to be some decisions made and I may not be happy. I may not be on that podcast that week because, you know, condolences. So can't, can't do the podcast with less than five monitors. It's just a rule. Okay, exactly. <laughs> All right. So for me, I have been working on the website. Now, for those of you who have been following along, this has been a journey. It's a journey that I never want to trans go down again, like ever, 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 because this has been a tedious, horrible journey. I've learned a lot. So if you remember last week, I was not happy with Hugo, but there's not anything else out there that doesn't require an equal amount of learning. And it's not that it you know, don't want to learn new things. It's just that I don't have the time to go learn Jekyll or, or whatever the other ones are out there. So I, I just say this thing is how I already knew Hugo and put a whole bunch of effort into Hugo that I just stay with it. And I'm happy that I did uh, because I have all the scripts and stuff I need in order to update the site with just a, with just an alias or whatever. I got all this stuff set up. So I've been going through very slowly. First off, I got 
it so that I could finally upload individual pages for the what each podcast episode. I did that without having it in the feed, which is my main goal there. I wanted to make sure it wasn't in the blog loop. So I did that. That ended up being easier than I thought it was going to be, which is good. Uh, and once I got that done, I set up the RSS feed. So there's now an RSS feed. I've also, if you subscribe to the podcast or the to the blog before, there's now a 301 redirect. So you can don't have to change the URL. It will just keep updating. So you just be able to carry on every time I publish a blog post. So I did that. And then I've been going slowly through every single page of episodes that we have and updating the embedded players because Hugo does not support iframes out of the box. You have to create short codes in order to do it. And I had to learn how to do it, how to make my own short codes for both Fireside and YouTube. And I had to get all that stuff squared away. And then I had to go and I have to go through every single page to redo that. And it's been it's not something I want to do again because it's just T. It's not hard. It's just page after page of page of copy and paste, copy and paste the URLs and stuff. It's not great. I'm I have all the way through season six done. I have half of season seven done and I need to do the rest of season seven and all of season eight and then I will be done. And then once Drew it has the next cloud up, I will go back through again and place all the show notes links from season seven and season eight to the next cloud where it needs to go. So that that's what I've been basically doing. I, I, every time I've wor- looked away from work, that's what I've been doing is is replacing the stuff on the, the website. So if you go to the website, which is linuxcast.org, you'll be able to see the fruits of my labor and uh, definitely do that. So there you go. So so we all, we've all actually installed Nobara on hardware and used it for various periods of time. So I used it for about a week and a half off and on. Not full time, not as a daily driver. That's how long I use it. Drew, how long did you use it? I would say a total of about six hours. A, okay. a total of about six hours. Okay. Maybe a little bit longer. I'll, I'll go right. up to eight, maybe. Yeah. Okay. What about you, Nate? Probably two days max. Okay, that's fine. With all the hours that I have in. So. Yeah, there, there was no, like, like if you just installed it 30 minutes for the podcast, yeah. it would have been fine. Yeah. So the fact that we all managed to do it over, like Drew, I know for a fact, had it installed days and days ago. So not like he just at noon today decided he was going to install it. So we all installed saw that we've all used it for a varied period of time and we all have some thoughts. So what I want to do, I think the best way to do this first is just kind of to go in an order of some kind. So let's just first talk about what version we use. So Drew, what version did you end up using? I actually installed the KDE, was it that, like the flagship version basically. So KDE, and I'm not a KDE like fan at all. So, but I wanted to give it the, the, you know, the, what it was due. So I wanted to see what the developer had planned, <laughs> planned for Nabara. So I installed just the top link on the website. Now the thing that was, I don't know if you guys had the same issue as far as installation is concerned. I couldn't just like put the ISO on a USB and install it directly. Is that the case with you guys as well? No, no? I put it I put it on Ventoy and it worked fine. Oh, see, okay, I had to do that rather than just like plug in, you know, like cuz I usually just like DD the uh the ISO onto a, its own dedicated USB and that did not work. You actually, I had to use Ventoy for it to work correctly during the installation. It so, probably has to do with Secure Boot. Okay. All right. Because makes... Ventoy actually disables Secure Boot. Okay. Well, th- there you go. Maybe right, that yeah. was the reason. So I, I, I was a little like, why, why can't I freaking install this? So like just using it, because I always do it. I never use Ventoy. Well, I won't say never. I haven't used Ventoy in quite a while because I haven't installed anything in, in quite a while. And I have one Debian USB, so it doesn't make sense to have like a bunch of stuff on a Ventoy disk or USB stick. So anyway, I had to do that. I had to actually create a Ventoy USB and then put the Nabara on it for it to install correctly. So I guess you guys are the same. Yeah. Nate, what version did you end up using? I just pulled the official one that has the uh, KDE custom thing that Nabara actually does. So... Okay, see that I'm actually mightily confused because I thought that the KDE was like the secondary version. I thought the GNOME version was the official version. It was last time. Yeah. Okay. 
That's where I got confused. So we actually all ended up using the same version. <laughs> That's okay. It, 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 really, I don't think that much of it matters, but some of my notes were talking about and under my false assumption that the GNOME thing, because some of the dedicated apps that he's created are GTK applications. So I'm assuming that's just left over from when GNOME was the default. So that that makes sense why some of them are also why, why some of them are QT now. Why he kind of has that mix between QT and GTK. Okay, that that makes way more sense because one of one of the things that I wrote down was like, why is this? Why is he doing it in two different frameworks? It doesn't really make sense to me. So, uh, yeah. So yeah, I also use the KDE version. I thought about hunting out one of the other versions, but KDE is just mostly what I'm familiar with, and I don't like you know at all so it was like drew said it was the top link so <laughs> the, we're, we're very, it's hey, true <laughs> it's, it's the generation today when they when they google something and they always just go to the first link on google and that's the answer yeah <laughs> we've got some bad bad habits guys do right, any and, of you guys actually have nvidia uh gpu okay and so did you have me. to install a different because they have nvidia installs correct it automatically it like when you're going through the install it automatically okay. detects your card okay yeah that's what i mean that's what happened with me on the official release so i have i use it on the laptop and that has a built-in ad uh, amd uh, gpu or apu or whatever it's called uh, and it found the once i got into the driver man manager it found the the drivers for that as well although it feels like that should be I, like I didn't really pay attention to what it was installing when I should have, but it did it must have installed the G, the proprietary drivers then, right? Because the the Mesa stuff yeah. already in. So the... I had to go back and look at my ISO. I actually did download the Nvidia ISO, but it automatically detected what like GPU I had and stuff, and installed what it. I think it installed. I want to say it did install the five sixty driver, but it may have been the five fifty five for Nvidia. I can't remember. I had to go look at it. Okay. So let's go ahead and then talk about our first impressions. Okay. So the, the what you what did you think when you first booted into it and install after you got the install done? So uh, Nate, why don't you go first? You want my honest answer? Yes. Oh, wow, as another KDE distro. <laughs> That's my <laughs> honest answer. It sounds terrible, but I don't uh, like it when I installed it. And I pulled it up. I was like, oh, the theme is kind of nice. But immediately I ran into a couple plasma issues, which I'll get into later. But yeah, it was just like, oh, there's another KDE distro. I will say the theming is very nice. It looks good. I thought it was well thought out. And that's about all I got to say for it. I'm wondering if I actually did use something because when I put it into for me, it just was a breeze theme. It's just bre that's what it uses is breeze, right? I believe so. Like a breeze yeah. dark. Yeah so, yeah, so I mean, yeah. here's, here's what I wrote down as a fairly vanilla KDE 6 experience. So that's that that's my first sentence of my first impression. So, of but if you look more into it, you can see some of the things that they did to kind of, it's slightly different, but it's still the same, if that makes sense. So the, the, the deeper you dive into it, the more you're like, oh yeah, it's, it, there's a few little differences, but not much. I will say that he did a good job, or they did a good job of making sure that the GTK stuff all come came out as a dark theme. Like you guys know, when you pop into a an ISO or whatever, and it, you you're using GNOME or whatever, another QT thing pops up and it's bright white. Everything else is dark or whatever. Uh, and you go into K uh, KDE and you're using the dark theme, and all of a sudden you get a GTK app and it's add way to light. Uh, they did a really good job of making sure that that. W was not the case in this it was always dark and if you switch to breeze light it actually switch the gtk theme as well which was was a nice little touch after you delve deep a little bit further nate what what did you have anything beyond just uh kde thoughts not honestly yeah see the problem is i'm the only kde guy in the room um so it'll be interesting <laughs> uh so yeah, drew what about true. you what what were your uh first impressions well the first thing i saw was that welcome screen the welcome screen had like, you know, some here, here's some things to do first steps, basically, you know, the first steps. And what it did was it said, it said, update your system. So you, you can do that. And I think it, it actually had quite a bit of an update, maybe like 100 to 150, 200 packages that needed to be updated post install. And so I'm, I'm okay with that, especially, but it was as a Debian user that uses the command line exclusively, 
I'm not a very good like gooey updater. I, I maybe that's just me, but I I kind of like <laughs> turned it off and did did an update in the command line instead because it just made it just didn't make any sense to me to like watch it go through the the GUI and and do everything. You have a question, Matt. I could tell. <laughs> no, I, I'm I'm I wanted to express my full throated agreement with what you're saying there because that that Nobara updater is really weird. Like, so the the purpose behind Nobara, according to the website, is to take Fedora and make it easier for the new new Linux user, the new Fedora user, rather, right? And part of the reason why you'd want to create a GUI updater is because it would most people are f more familiar with the the GUI, right? But then he emulated it after a terminal, and it just wasn't well designed. It wasn't like big, like, like had, had like four or five very similar size buttons. And some of them were grayed out while it was doing the update of the re like the repositories in the background. And then a button came up and said install updates. But if you don't actually get in there and like put your glasses on and read the, what it is, it can be very, it was very confusing for me the first time. I was like, this doesn't feel like a very well designed app. And I was like, why, like, like have either of you guys used Endeavor OS? Yes. Not in a while, but yes, I have. And, and, and Endeavor, when it does an update, it, like it has a button in the welcome screen that says update system, and then it just pops open a terminal and runs Pac-Man. You know, that's what it feels like this should have done. It would have made more sense. I mean, people aren't s totally scared away from a terminal, it could, especially when you went to the trouble of making that updater look like the terminal, right? It just it was weird. You know, yeah. like I don't like most new users don't need to see the like it, it just create a, a loading bar, like a progress bar. That would have made that's a new user thing, right? Yeah. One of the things I thought well, that was part of the first steps, though, it did identify what AMD GPU I was using, and did did a custom install of four, or, you know, whatever drivers. I think it was customize. It was a customized install of that particular AMD GPU, which I thought was really good, especially because I genuinely think that. The, the purpose of Nabara and the developer is this guy, Glorious Eggroll, okay, who is the developer for Proton GE. So his whole thought in developing Nabara was to make gaming as easy as possible. And he's done interviews where he talks about he's developed Nabara for himself and is for his dad, who, who are both gamers, okay? And so I liked what that did for me because I, especially with the AMD GPU. So it's like, Oh, that's the one I need. Okay, cool. And it installed it for you. And so if I was a gamer, which I, I am clearly the, the worst gamer of the three of us, that would have been something that I would have appreciated uh, because it did have all the other pre-installed applications like steam and Lutris and the proton GE and things like that already pre-installed. So I don't know what benefit that has for me. That's the thing. Yeah, not, not much of a gamer ear either, but in that welcome screen, I was... So the... Did you guys... Uh, I, I'm going to make a weird comparison here. I wrote this down several times. Did you guys, throughout the time you were using this, get flashbacks to Manjaro? Or was that just me? Like, so there is a... Nabara package no, manager that looks that. exactly, yeah. or it doesn't look exactly, but it, it acts exactly like PAMAC. So you open that thing up, it has a list of, of programs from the repositories that are installed or you can install it. And you just go through and check marks the box and press apply and it'll install things. That, that's exactly how PAMAC works. And and then the purpose of Nabara is very similar to what Nanjaro does. Like it takes Arch, makes it more user friendly, has GUI applications as a front end for all the command line stuff, which you'd have to deal with in the arch. So as I was using this, I was like, this reminds me a ton of what Manjaro does. And I know Manjaro has such a bad reputation for all sort of reasons, but that just is stuck in my mind. And the reason why I mentioned with the, with the, the welcome screen is because Manjaro also has that welcome screen. I now they all, all distros have welcome screens, but this just reminded me a lot of Manjaro. There was, um, another thing is that, uh, they have, a like recommended apps thing. There's like four apps there. Like that, that, a lot of times when you do the recommended apps things, there's like um a whole whole page. But for this, it was like OBS, 
and yeah, yeah. Uh, Discord, and I'm, there was like two other ones there. Yeah, there was. And and yeah. that was like that was it. Like that didn't seem that useful. And it's weird because OBS is mentioned specifically on the website as something that is like hard for new users to install. And yet I figured with the way they, I mean, they they pre-installed other things, but OBS wasn't pre-installed. It feels like that was something that they would it would have been already installed because it's like like people game and stream or whatever. Uh, maybe I mean giving people options is fine. It just felt like something that would be installed. So other first impressions that you guys wanted to share? Uh, no, to I me, do want to... Sorry, go ahead, Nate. My bad. Well, to me, it kind of reminded me more of Arco's welcome screen, to be honest. Just more uh in this layer instead of this layer. So more um vertical instead of horizontal. That's kind of what it reminded me of. Yeah, I can see that. It felt like baby's first uh, GTK application. Mm-hmm. It is what it is what it looks like, right? It's just like this is the way a welcome app is supposed to look, and that's the way it you know works, right? Um, what were you going to say, Drew? I will, well, two things. One, I was going to say I know that you guys have at least installed MX Linux before, and that has kind of an, a neat uh, welcome type screen that has a great deal of of work that's gone into installing and things like that. I thought that was probably one of the better ones that I've seen of the distros that I've tried. The other thing that I, I wanted to mention that um, in the chat there was a, is Nabara on the latest kernel? Now, yes and no, because the developer, like I said, Glorious Agrol, he has a, an incredibly custom kernel package that he has patched to death for the gamer. And so he uses like the Zen kernel and then has other things, including fractional scaling and stuff like that, that has gone into his custom kernel. But, you know, as someone who's on like 6.1, this is still 6.11.5. It's like much, much further along the uh, uh, the kernel cycle than, than anything I've tried in a, in, a, in a really long time. Every time we talk about custom kernels, I think about Jake. <laughs> I was going to say, TKG is technically kind of what it's like, to yeah. be honest. <laughs> yeah. All right. So another thing that I, I saw that I just wrote down was just like the overall impress impressions for me were that it, it was it's a very it, a very cohesive first experience. Like the welcome app is very good. You can follow things through from beginning to end very easily. It gets you where you need to go. It has links to the driver manager. It has links to the updater if you want to use the updater. One thing I will say is, I, did you guys, were you guys forced to do that initial update or did it give you an option? Because for me, it said I had to do it. I don't, I don't know that I had to. I don't think I did either. Yeah, it, it, it said something like, um, I, I wish I'd taken a screenshot of it or something because it, it maybe there was an option to, to bypass it and I just missed it or something like that. It was, it, was, it popped up because for me, the updater popped up before the welcome app did. Like it was completely crowded out and the, the, update, the updater was just there in my face. Probably could just close it like a moron. I didn't. But it, it felt... One of the things, one of my pet peeves about some of these distros is when they have multiple things that pop up on first boot. And especially one that proclaims itself for being a, a, like user friendly. Having multiple things pop up at the same time on that first boot, it was real, was kind of jarring. Also... I don't know if either of you guys use this on a laptop, but when I installed this on a laptop, that first boot had my fans going like crazy. I I did manage to have uh, get HTOP up and running. And there was something Python related running in the background that just completely took off every resource, like all CPU resources. It never happened again. It was just that first boot. So I don't know what was going on there. Uh, but probably the welcome app because ain't that based off of Python? Well, but I had the welcome app up, come up the second time I booted and it didn't do the same thing. Um, I mean, unless it's like compiling it to begin with it the first time, which I mean, I don't think so. But I mean, possibly. I I don't know. I didn't recognize what the Python. It just said Python. You, you guys know when you see Python in the in the thing, it just says slash n Python or whatever. So yeah, that's one thing I know. It's like the the speed the the fans were just like airplane noise right there at the beginning it was really weird. So I also have written down. Uh, that the about the updater thing, so we can we talked about that. So let's go ahead and talk about after your first impressions. Your, after you got into actually using things, what was your guys' experience installing software? Were you able to find things that you needed to find? Drew, I know you're not a DNF user, so did you have an entertaining time using <laughs> DNF? So it was funny because um, 
You know, I I typically take my bash RC from my GitHub and use it. And so I had to alter my bash RC so that I could actually use the command line instead of saying sudo apt install, blah, blah, blah. I, I changed everything to DNF. And so that was that was fine. I was fine with that. The thing that I found more challenging, I mean, it's not challenging. Let me, let me just put it out there. As far as KDE, it's not my cup of tea. It's as far as any desktop environment, not my cup of tea. So what did I do? I sudo DNF install hyperland, okay, to see what that would mean on, if I'm going to, if I'm going to use a Wayland desktop environment, I might as well see, I'll try the uh, Wayland tiling window manager or compositor. Let's just, whatever. Anyway, hyperland was an easy install. It was 39.1. For those of you that are interested at all, the three of you in the chat that may be interested in that. So I installed Hyperland and Gnome, actually. I installed all three just to see if I liked one better than the other. And, and since I had a Hyperland configuration, I was able to just like kind of like, you know, oh, there we go. That's Hyperland. And yeah, it works great. And I had no problems with that. The only thing that I should have done was actually install the uh, Rofi Wayland version of Rofi that I did not do. But overall, I had no problems using the uh, you know DNF and using command line to do anything, really. Well, the syntax for DNF and apt are pretty similar, right? You know, yeah. install, search stuff. So it, it's not like Arch where you have to learn random freaking letters to know what yeah. the hell to do stuff, right? What about you, Nate? Did you, were you able to find the software and stuff that you were able to use or need and oh, yeah. stuff? Oh, yeah. It was pretty easy for me because I used Fedora back in the day. So I was already used to it. And on top of that, uh, I actually found it almost as easy to install flat packs as Pop! OS, which kind of surprised me. Because Fedora, it can be, sometimes it can be a dependency. What's a good word I'm looking for here? <laughs> Anyways, it, it, it can be kind of crazy on Fedora. But yeah, it actually installed, and I didn't really have a lot of permission issues with a lot of the Flatpak apps, which is really nice. Because, you know, sometimes you get a hold of the distro, and for some reason the permissions are just not there. Uh, Arch that's behind me, that's one of them. So I also installed quite a few Flatpaks. I say I, I'm trying to do a challenge for myself, because like you, Drew, I'm very much a terminal-centric user, right? Like I want to open up the terminal, do DNF, update, whatever, and, and update it that way. But... Because this is supposed to be for new users, I challenged myself to just use the GUIs as much oh, as possible. Okay. And I will say this. I have had many words about Discover over the years. And at one point, like a year ago, I would have said, Discover has gotten better. Well, folks, Discover has gotten worse again. Like, like it, it, that first boot, now, once I got it booted up, it was fine. Like, it, it, it did okay. And, and they have worked wonders on the UI of Discover to make it more user friendly, but that first boot was astonishingly slow. It took almost a full minute to actually load. I don't know if you guys remember, if you ever used Ubuntu back when snaps were first being introduced, opening up the snap store for the first time, it took like a minute and a half to load. This was like that. Like it was really freaking slow and I don't know what was going on in the background or it, and I don't think I actually ever opened Discover again. So I don't know if, it, if that was just gonna be a first boot thing, like I had to, put things in the proper places or whatever because it's the first boot or if it's you know something would happen every time uh, but finding software was fine because it just uses flat hub that's all it does like it doesn't use the fedora version of the of flat hub which is very minimal and all free software it uses actual flat hub which is nice so if, if you have ever installed from flat hub you know exactly what's there i will also say that vim was installed by default which is good a lot of distros don't do that so that that was nice HTOP wasn't, NeoFetch was, so... Yeah, that was uh, weird. Yeah, mm -hmm. right? So, so I mean, so some things there. Also, when you go through some of the pre-installed applications, like, Inkscape was there, and that felt weird to me, but GIMP wasn't. Like, okay, like, um, interesting choices. Uh, also, I, I was expecting more in terms of pre-installed software... Uh, for gaming and stuff like that. There's there's Steam, there's Lutris. Obviously, there's the things that go along with that, like Wine Tricks and Proton G and stuff like that. And I I think there's stuff for like capturing frame rate and stuff like that, like Mango HUD and stuff. I think is installed or something like that. Maybe one of the forks of it or whatever. But I like there wasn't a lot of 
extra stuff. There was there was the the tools that came along with the bar, like the the updater and stuff like that. And then there was the gaming stuff. But everything else was just basically f- stock KDE. And it wasn't the full KDE suite, which is good because that would have been huge. But I was kind of actually expecting more in terms of pre-installed software. I thought there would be more interesting choices made than just basically Fedora, right? That, that's what I came around. You know, that's what I thought of it anyways. It was like, this is, this is Fedora, right? <laughs> like there's not, in terms of pre-installed software, that's basically what that is. It's the KD spin of, of Fedora. I have, I've never had a really good experience with Fedora. Sorry. I, I just never did. And this was probably my favorite Fedora like experience so far. And maybe I haven't used it in a while, but I'm just saying, I, you know, I have not enjoyed every time I've tried Fedora. It's not been an enjoyable experience. I will say uh, too that I actually found that some of the codecs that are normally not pre-installed was actually installed on the bar. I, I know for me, even with Pop OS, I have to you know do the Ubuntu restricted extras, and it was actually already they already actually had that on the bar. So that was kind of nice and from my standpoint because I looked at it from somebody that's coming from a production view to. A gaming distro and really that's all it is it's mostly just a gaming distro yeah the codex thing and i think that's part of like the, the thing that they're supposed to like that's part of the reason why he's done this is he, he wants to make it fedora but easier to use right so i mean he, yes he has a gaming slant but in, in like the first paragraph on the website is like he take fedora and solve some of its fault flaws and one of the things he mentioned is is codex another one was making software easier to install and updating it easier and things like that so Oh, and add, adding repos. Like, like if you go into regular Fedora, you have to enable the third-party repositories, and then you maybe maybe you have to enable RPM Fusion, which nobody knows how to do out of the box for the first time. Like, and some of the instructions for enabling RPM Fusion are like 20 years old, and you don't even know if they still work, or if you even even really need to do it anymore. Who knows? You know, it's it, you know. So the fact that all that stuff is done out of the box is pretty nice. Like. This feels like the way Fedora would do it if they weren't so anal retentive about avoiding lawsuits. Like every other distro installs, you know, codecs and stuff. Every other distro installs all the repositories. Yeah, like you don't see Arch being little ninny babies about installing this stuff out of the box. Yet now, granted, granted, Fedora is corporate sponsored by Rel by Red Hat and they're owned by IBM so they'd have a lot more to lose than the arch guys if they did get sued for all of their money I suppose so yeah but it's still technically just a branch of it right well supposedly it's a community district like this like right. if, if if you ask a, a a red hatter if fedora is under their control they'll tell you no but if you also go cross check the people who develop fedora and work at red hat there's some intermingling there to say the least, right? So, yeah, it, it's it's interesting because Fedora is one of those distros where it feels like it should be a flagship f- distro, and yet it has the things that you have to do out of the box that don't really work well for new users. And I think Nabara does do a good job of making it so you don't have to do those little, you know, piddly things uh, when you first start up into it. So that that was good. Can we, let's just talk a little bit first. I mean, I, this is kind of going back a little bit, but now that I think about it, now that I know that we've all used the KDE version for a little while, can can we talk a little bit about the, that choice? Because a lot of distros ha- had that choice and chose to go the GNOME route. And, and when I mean other distros, I mean literally everyone else, you know? Um, it's interesting that this one decided to go to the KDE stuff. So, so when you guys mentioned that like this is a change like it used to be, it used to be Gnome. Yeah, I think uh, Nabara thirty nine was a Gnome, had Gnome, and this is Nabara forty, has KDE as its kind of like main desktop environment. I'd be curious because you know I don't know if you guys are aware, but uh, Fedora forty one came out today, as a matter of fact, and so I'm wondering how long it's going to be for the next cycle and what that would mean to Nabara going forward. Because uh, I don't think that they're going to change. I think that I think that maybe the user experience for gamers using GNOME was not what he wanted, and maybe KDE was more 
Windows-like, and he wanted to just exploit that environment for you know for any for anyone that wanted to switch from a Windows gaming PC to a Nabara gaming PC. It was more palatable that way. Makes sense. I will. I will note. I did notice that there was no X orb to be had like anywhere. Mm. Right. It was just completely Wayland. I I did vaguely remember after I noticed that that Fedora had. The KDE sprint also went that direction. I'm not. Sh- did Did you guys know if regular vanilla van- uh, Fedora also went Wayland only this time, or is there still an XOR session? Does anybody know that? I don't. Yeah, I know. None, of, none of us are Fedora users, so we wouldn't know. Maybe somebody in the but chat. But I thought can tell they us. were. I, I thought, but I don't. I can't confirm that. I thought See, they I, were, but yeah. I knew that the KDE spin for sure was. I didn't know if, if about vanilla. The KDE, cho- the choice of KDE is very interesting to me because first off, it has a ton of packages, right? So that means maintaining that ISO is going to be a pain in the rear end for eternity because it's just it's it, it's it's 12 dozen packages that you have to install and keep updated every single one. And, you know, maybe you're just using the Fedora spin to base off that somebody else. Maybe basically somebody else has to do that kind of work um, or if he's maintaining the pulling the packages and, and, and choosing what's there himself. You know, he has to do all that work. And that's one of the reasons why like Ubuntu and Fedora and you know arch and all and debian they they don't choose you know kde as their flagship because it has all these packages you just have to maintain right and it, it, every time i see a distro that does choose kde it always makes me interesting because it, it does mean it feels like it means extra work for the the maintainer so i actually know the answer to this the reason why coming from somebody that was a gamer uh, the reason why, and actually somebody did mention in chat, is that KDE actually supports more Wayland protocols than GNOME does. And when you're talking about a gaming distro, you want things like high refresh rate. You want things like your monitors have different refresh rates or different resolutions and all that kind of stuff to actually just work. And a lot of people don't realize, too, that gamers are tinkers out of the box. Like, we will go to extremes to finally get our game to work. And that's one of the probably one of the biggest reasons why I switched to KDE is because it, it is more there's just more options. But as a gamer, I personally like the more options. I know, I know that sounds weird for me being on Pop OS. Like I like more options, but still, I, you know, I did as a gamer, and I was a tweak. You know, I like to tweak my system and all that kind of stuff to get the very cutting edge. And with the Wayland support, you know, especially with high ref- refresh rate, that's the biggest thing that x11 just can't really do very well and so i, I kind of see why he went that route to be honest and i also will say too that if you think about it he's kind of given them more of an arch experience of being more up to date than not also give them the full arch experience if that makes sense yeah and the on the kde front the i've forgotten what i was gonna say it's completely went out my head so i don't remember so let's go ahead and talk about gaming for a little while. Uh, Drew, you are not a gamer. Not, did you, not even did you, a little bit. Did you? All right, let, let, let's shock the audience. Did you try gaming at all while you were using this? <laughs> no, man. <laughs> Shocking. Uh, it's no, okay. I, I mean, I was using Hyperland and actually enjoying it. So that was that was the Hyperland this is like is a game, the game right? Yeah, that's exactly right. That's exactly right. <laughs> Look at all right. these cool animations. They did a really good job. Absolutely. There, <laughs> all right. What about you, Nate? Did you do any gaming while you're on Nabara? Yes, I actually did two. No, three, actually. Uh, the first one I tried was Fallout. Four because I have a I uh, download from my Pop OS machine straight to it, and it actually worked really well. I was getting a solid sixty FPS, never had any issues. The install went really well. I went to Stardew Valley because it was a really quick <laughs> download for me, and that worked fine. Minecraft Launcher, that was the third one I tried. At first, it gave me some fits. I don't know why. But once I rebooted my system and pulled it back up, it actually allowed me to connect my Microsoft account because you got to have one. And I was able to play Minecraft. And it was I was getting close to 800 FPS, so it done pretty well. Wow. So can I ask a question? What When you normally play those games, is this an improvement in FPS or about the same? Or It's about the same with Pop! OS, to be honest. There, w- I will say that Fallout 4 did run smoother. Not so much the FPS was better, but it actually ran smoother. Okay. And I don't know if that's the fact that, you know, it's it's 
based off the Wayland protocol, which 100% could be. And Pop! OS is still technically X11 for now. But yeah, it, it did run smoother. I didn't have the um, the little glitches that I have sometimes while playing a game on here. Do you know what kernel that your Pop! machine is using is it it's nowhere close to the uh to the one that he's using this like oh no 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 no. it's a 6.9.3 okay oh yeah so i did some gaming as well i installed so my first what i wanted to do was first was challenge it to install a a game that doesn't work on open susa and i wanted to see if it would take that challenge and it did so I'm a subscriber to that EA Pass thing that you can get in Steam. It's like $25 a year or whatever, and you get access to a vast majority of a vast selection of EA games. Now, obviously, people have their own opinions about EA, but there's a few of them like Madden that I really like, Sims, SimCity, things like that. There's some uh, Need for Speed stuff that that I really like uh, from yesteryear, and it's just like a lot of really good games. So uh, one of the games that I can never get working on OpenSUSE is Sims 4. And it just won't, it will launch Origin, it will look like it's going to launch, it will launch into like the loading screen of Sims, and it will just not work any further than that. Uh, it worked perfectly fine in Nabara. Like it, it it installed, it was slow, but I'm going to blame that on it being a laptop with integrated graphics uh, than anything else. You know, it's just a, a regular, like it's a mobile CPU and all that stuff. So I'm going to assume that the reason why it was slow to load was because of that. Um, but once it got loaded up, I think I was getting like 45 to 60 frames per second varying stuff. So it was really good. And the fact that it played at all was pretty impressive. Because like I said, I had no luck getting it to play on OpenSUSE at all. So I did that and I played that for a little while. And it, it was full featured. It brought in all the DLC content that I have and it worked fine. Uh, I also tried one that I knew was going to not play well on a laptop. And that's City Skylines 2. It launched. It did not play. But I don't think that that's going to be a Nabara thing. I think that that's just going to be that you put that on a laptop, you're going to expect your your laptop to explode. Because it's just one of those games. It requires you to have a full-fledged, dedicated GPU, and it, that laptop just doesn't. So it was very, very sluggish and was unplayable. The other one that I tried was Spyro. That did play well enough, but it turned my laptop into an oven. Uh, but that's not all that surprising because it does it on my desktop as well. Just turn it... it has no optimization for Linux, so it turns the everything to 150 degrees. It's really, 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 in, in terms of resources, it takes everything and turns it into an oven. So uh, those are the three that I played. The The Sims really did impress me, just that effect that it ran. Because like I said, I've had so much problems with it in the past, uh, getting it to actually run. So And the, and the fact that it was able to use it from Origin, because like you, you, get, you download it from Steam, and Steam installs Origin on top of Steam, and so it brings up, every time you launch it, it brings up the Origin launcher and you got to do all that stuff. And that works really, really well, which is not something that always happens because Origin is utter dog shit. So, you know, it, this this time this experience was pretty damn good and I was pretty impressed. What I will say, though, is that I wish there was a way for him to enable Proton out of the box. You know, because if the first thing you install Steam, you have to go into settings, enable Proton so that it will actually play your Windows games. Uh, I don't think that that's something he can actually do, but it would have been a really nice experience able to just go in there and install the Windows games without having to go splunking into the settings of Steam again to try to find out where the Proton thing is moved. Because they moved it again. It's incompatibility now. It's something where they, they renamed it or something. Overall, gaming was pretty impressive. Now, again, remember, I'm not a gamer. Nate, you're much more of a gamer than I am. Fall four and stuff. So, um, yep. Overall, I do have a question though. Good. I did, my question was, what what is the your laptop specs? Because I'm a little surprised that the second one didn't run. Oh, it, like it ran. It was a very very sluggish. It was. It's a Ryzen. I believe it's like a Ryzen seven something or the other. It's m- m- most recent Ryzen seven uh, with the integrated graphics. Um, like I said, it, it ran, but it did not. It may very well be mods because I do have mods enabled in that game. Um, okay. So if I had taken the mods out, it would have been fine. But in City Skylines 2, taking mods out is actually kind of a pain in the rear because they've built them in. It doesn't use the workshop anymore, so you can't just turn them off. Yeah. The reason why I was asking, because I know City Skylines, I had to make sure I had four gigabytes of RAM available on my Ryzen chip for the uh, iGPU to actually function correctly. I think I have 16 or 32 in this one. So I, I think RAM wasn't the problem. 
I, I think it was I, it probably was the mod because I haven't used City Skylines in a while. So you, you know, every time you launch City Skylines, it has to do with all the updating of the mods, and that takes a ton of resources, even on something that has a ton of RAM and stuff. So I'm gonna guess that that was the problem. So maybe if I waited it out a little bit, but I'm I have no patience for any of that stuff. That's the reason why I haven't played it in ages, because I I don't want it, it's like every time I oh launch into the xbox or whatever i have to do an update because i haven't played it in six months and by the time it's done with the updates i don't want to play anymore like i'm done my attention span is not that long you could do what i do with star uh uh was it starfield because <clears throat> their mods can be like well over three gigabytes each and so sometimes i will literally set it to update the mods and walk away and go to bed <laughs> it isn't more than that I'm ready to play. <laughs> so it's like, I, I want to play this game tomorrow, so I'll just set it up exactly. tonight and pause. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Let me ask a question about Wine. Since it's pre-installed, is there things that that run on Windows that becomes easier to run on something like Nabarro? Like, and I'm not talking about a game. I'm talking about, like, I don't know. Let's Outlook, let's say. Microsoft, this is a curiosity question. Microsoft I have no Office idea. would be a weird one because it would have to be an older version. I don't think that 365 is available through Wine. I, I may okay. be wrong on that, but I, I think like the, the, like the older versions of Outlook would be there. The older versions of like Photoshop would be there. Um, like no Notepad Q P plus plus or whatever that would be there. Nate, go ahead. Okay. Well, I was gonna say uh, there is a 365 version, but that's technically a flat pack, which already has. You know the dependency it needs. Really interesting. Yeah. Okay. But it's not it now. Keep on. It's not official, mm. but there is a flat pack, and that and it does work because I actually have it on that one. Okay. That that bundles all the stuff and then just like includes wine in the everything. Yep. Yeah. Wow. Huh. That's kind of cool. I mean, so what I found a bar for. Sorry. What was easy for me was actually the fact that wine is already pre-installed. There's a lot of things that's uh, that you don't have to do. As far as like older games, for example, older uh, Windows XP games, older Windows 7 type games, those things you could just install and it pretty much works almost out of the box. And then there's other things that you can install like Play on Linux, which has, you know, quite a few different things that you can install pretty easy. And so for Wine to already be installed, that means you don't have to go through the process of installing Wine because sometimes Wine can be a little bit of a pain to get it fully installed. So. Do you know if it includes a lot of... Because, like, a lot of those older games or stuff like that, you have to install all the Microsoft fonts and stuff. Do you know if it includes a lot of those stuff already? Because I didn't actually yeah, test could, that. Yeah, because remember the Codex. Yeah. A lot of the Codex and stuff are already installed. So, yeah, it, it already had Microsoft fonts in, available. Okay. Yeah, I should I should have tested some of those. Stuff. Well, I, I mentioned this earlier, but I was surprised that there wasn't more pre-installed software that seemed more original to this distro. One of the things I, I like, Hero Game Launcher wasn't there. I was kind of expecting that. I was expecting the the the, the GOG launcher. That stuff was not. Doesn't mean you can't install them yourself, obviously. But it just being a gaming focused distro, I thought that some of those would already be there, and they just weren't. Right? It was just surprising to me. It's like it's not a bad thing. It just was surprising. Right? Well, are they installed on SteamOS? Because I'm pretty sure close to, if I remember right, what he had installed was pretty close to what came with SteamOS. So that's no. Yeah, they're, they're, yeah. Okay. I, th all, I think I think all it's installed on SteamOS is Steam, right? Okay, yeah, so. that that's what I kind of figured. So I I think that's kind of the route he took, and beyond his Lutris is kind of like an extra thing for him. So yeah, um, I, I, I think that's one of the reasons why I thought the others would be there because Lutris was there, but Lutris also does require you to install quite a bit of extra stuff to go along with it. So he probably did that for uh, ease of use, right? Yeah, in Hero Launcher, you really don't. Yeah, because it's just flat pack, right? So yep. You none of you guys. I, I'm hesitant to even ask the question, but I know that you guys, or I know that Nate is like big into DaVinci Resolve, and they say that this is really stinking easy to install. But I think it was for only for AMD GPU. Is that does that sound right? Was easy to install, but it was just as easy to install as on Bluefriend. So okay. I edited, right. I edited right. the last video on this, and it worked fine. Like, like he has a script. Okay, so in the welcome app, there's a there's a button there that says uh, like a launch like a launch for uh, DaVinci fixes or whatever. And what I believe that does is it moves the the depreciated libraries into another folder so that it can actually launch. That's what you have to do in order to install on all Fedora distros, as far as I know. 
Um, and I think it probably does the the ROCM thing for AMD stuff uh, that you linked to the other day, right? That, that probably is in there as well. For me, I just installed it the way that I always that I did on 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 Bluefin, and I just installed it manually through the terminal. Okay. Just because that's the way that I was familiar with it, and 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 uh, knew that it was going to work. So I, by the time I had it installed, I I then remembered that that button was in there, and so I don't actually know precisely what that did. Did, um, but it worked fine. Like it worked exactly as well as it d does on Bluefin, which is not surprising because they're both Fedora. I I don't know how it really differed to be honest with you it felt basically the same it was slower but that's a laptop and i usually use it on a nvidia gpu for the dedicated gpu stuff so nate did you install resolve at all on this no absolutely not <laughs> i would to me I'd, I'd even really consider it just because simple fact. i know that the install script is there i just i always you know bar as a gaming distro so I didn't even bother. I wish it had been an install because it's not actually an install script. It's just a fixer, right? It just fixes it right. after yeah. it's installed. I really, um, when I saw Nabarro there, I was like, oh, I got really excited because you know me, I bitch and moan about the installation of Resolve all the time. If there was a distro that just had a button that said install DaVinci Resolve, I would hop from OpenSUSE today, okay? Uh, I, th that That's where I'm at right now. I was like, I would do that because installing it is such a pain in the rear. So. I would do that, but that's not what uh, it got me over well, okay. excited, but it's not that Good. the one thing I was going to test and I didn't ever get to it because once again, my job was, has been kind of crazy. There's actually a guy in GitHub that is trying to convert resolve to a flat pack. And more in particular, it is for Fedora. And I never really got a chance to actually try it and see how it, if it worked or not. I'm more interested. I, I may actually go back and try it. Actually, so he's creating a distro specific flat pack. He says is it's for Fedora because he says Fedora is really hard to get Resolve working. Okay, I kind of disagree because uh, once again you can install through a terminal pretty easy, but because I was actually hoping it's like hey, maybe I can install it on OpenSUSE. You know, what I mean? <laughs> like that's that's what I was like OpenSUSE to install work. Like I did get the install work. It's just you know shitty graphics card. I'll tell you what I'll do after this podcast. I'll actually try to install it on Ubuntu just to see if it will do it. And then maybe move to Arch. I don't have an open open SUSE computer, and probably never will. But get off my podcast. Just, just go away. <laughs> All right, let's go. the The next spot that I have on my notes are uh, is just general daily usage. So once you got everything installed, you've done your exploring. Was there anything you noticed in your daily? I I, I know we, you just used it for a few hours, but if you were to use it as a daily usage part, just doing some stuff, was there anything that stood out to you in terms of pain points or um, things that made th things that were easier on the bar than on the distro that you normally daily drive that stood out to you and just using it through? I'm thinking no, actually. I, I couldn't, you know, I use so few things, actually. You know, it's the fact. I, I, only, I use like about half a dozen things and that's it. You know, I don't really have a lot of need for software other than I need a browser, I need a terminal, I need my Genie, I need OBS, Discord. That's about it. <laughs> That's truly it, man. That's I don't really have needs for, yeah. Simple guy. All right. Yeah, I really, uh, yeah. All right. Nate, what about you? Did you, during your usage of it, did you see any pain points or things that were overly easy, uh, opposite ends of the spectrum? Which, what, what you got to say about that? I think the fact that my NVIDIA GPU was slightly older because I was using a um, a GTX, was it 1660 Super? The Lord, NVIDIA's naming scheme is terrible. I can't stand their naming scheme. But anyways, I was using that, and I think for the simple fact I had that, I had a couple of whaling issues and more particular plasma issues. <laughs> Because a few of my updates didn't work so well, and I got a TTY. So, but after, and what it was, it was literally NVIDIA a driver. And after I reinstalled the NVIDIA driver, popped right up. Never had any more issues. And so that was my main, my main gripe I had with it. And once again, it's KDE. I had Maybe that's the problem fan. too, Nate, because like 70% of the time I was in Hyperland, I, I don't, <laughs> that's the fact. I mean, I don't know that I actually spent that much time in KDE. I was probably. But see, okay, side rant. It's supposed to be one of those distros that NVIDIA just works. 
And for Pop! OS, it really is that way. But I did find that there was like a few, just a very few things that I felt like if I had an AMD card, I probably would have had a better experience off of Nabara. Now, I will say, when it comes to Lutris, the NVIDIA card actually worked better on Lutris than it did Pop! OS. I don't know how that works, but it did. And it may be because he already, you know, had a lot of the reconfigured stuff already installed and it already had those drivers ready and available. But yeah, that, that really, and really what the only thing that held me up was a few of those little plasma quirks. And I had a, oh, a, a QT, there was a conflict between QT5 and QT6. I had to figure that out. I, I don't even remember what I did to fix it, but I just kind of Googled it and somebody said, do this and I done it. And it worked. So. All right. So I have a few good things and a few bad things. So first off, NFS was really easy to connect to. Uh, that's not always the case. So I, I was impressed with that. I, we already talked about DaVinci Resolve, but I, I, I have a note here saying that it was basically the same experience as on Bluefin, which is not a surprise. And, and another thing that I found was that because it was KDE, batter, and comparing it to Bluefin at least, because Bluefin was what I had on before, so it was immediately comparable. Uh, battery life on Nabarro was worse, like significantly worse, like a whole hour less than, uh, than Bluefin. I think guys that that's going to be GNOME because GNOME works really hard on battery optimization where KDE doesn't really give a shit. At least it feels like, right? And so I, I went down from about four hours to two hours and 50 minutes in terms of actually, and that wasn't me like doing a, a DaVinci Resolve thing, right? That was just me opening Vivaldi, uh, messing around in Genie for, you know, several hours, and it was just dead. And so I was a little disappointed in the in the, in the the battery life. And I think a lot of that is KDE optimization, maybe because cause he uses that custom kernel, maybe that wasn't a focus. Because, it is, I mean, if you're going to create a gaming distro, most people aren't going to care about battery life because they're not going to be gaming on battery anyways, so that's not a big deal. But it's something that I tested and noticed. Now, I didn't... It was just a one-time thing. Maybe it would have been better, you know, using it more. But that first time, it just ate right through it. So uh, another thing I have in terms of pos uh, positives, gestures work really well on the on the tra trackpad. So uh, you can move between virtual desktops in KD with, with gestures similar to what you can do in GNOME. It wasn't quite as smooth as GNOME, but again, uh, that's a plasma thing. And also, un unlike Nate there, I had a actually fairly good plasma experience. It was pretty stable for me. I just feel like it had a good hair day. Like, I, I know if I went to use it again tomorrow, I'd have problems because that's plasma. Like, yeah, you can have you can just go and have a really good day with plasma and you feel like, oh, you're feeling pretty good about yourself. And then the next day, the the whole thing explodes. So, yeah, that that's that's my thoughts in terms of that. So the last part that I wanted to talk about, just would you uh, a use it uh, as if you know you wanted to or uh, and and or. Uh, would you recommend it to other people or who would you recommend it to? So, uh, Drew, those questions for you, sir. Yeah, I don't know that I have uh, a, <laughs> a lot of friends that are that are gamers. If, I mean, I guess if my son said, hey, what should I try? I might say, hey, Nabara. But I would typically not recommend it. And I think that for newer users that... I think it's fine for newer users. I think there are better solutions for newer users. That's a fact. Uh, the other thing that I would, you know, the other part of your question is, would I use it? No. No, I would not. No. I, 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 and, and not to mention, you know, uh, because of the desktop environment, because I don't want to use hyperlink. I mean, today, if you're asking me today, am I going to use it? No, no, no way. You know, I would not. Uh, trade in my GTK apps for anything. I would not trade in my uh, old ass BSPWM or DWM right now. No way. And in fact, if if you in the next two years, I don't see that happening either. But maybe after that, who knows? But so no, the answer is no. I would not be doing. I will not be moving on <laughs> to a different uh, desktop environment, and especially not a different uh, distribution. Okay, before before I ask Nate the same question, was there, was there any part of your notes that you had taken uh, that it didn't cover? I did put in a, um, let me just look real quick. I, I, I'm going to say no, because I think that we have covered quite a bit of everything. As far as um, simplified driver installation, we did mo uh, media codecs, we did kernel patches, we did hardware support. 
I, I I didn't know if anybody had a Steam Deck because I was really hoping actually when we talked about doing this originally, Tyler was really a lot more. I mean, and by the way, guys, Tyler showed up today. Just so you know, he just opted out. Just we're going to leave it at that. <laughs> but uh, I was hoping that he had a Steam Deck that he could actually try Nabara on because I think that is something that would be interesting to everybody, maybe. Uh, so, no, that's that's about it. Okay, I just wanted to make sure we didn't miss anything on your notes. All right, um, Nate, what about you? Would you use it uh, and or would you recommend it to anybody else? Would I use it? No. I'm sorry. Pop! OS is for NVIDIA cards. I'm still, anybody with a NVIDIA card, I'll still say use Pop! OS. Just because me it's just it just works and if somebody had an amd card or intel i would honestly tell them try linux mint because it you know ubuntu base but what i what i found a use case for that i think is very interesting i actually have an rtx uh six uh 6500 xt back here and i want to put it into a uh, htc pc and they have an iso for it and I think it would actually be a pretty nice little, especially with wine configuration out of the box, especially with Lutris. I think it would be a pretty nice little uh, TV console gaming thing. And so for that use case, yes, I probably would use it. Okay. Uh, and on your old man notes, was there anything there that we missed that you wanted to talk about? No, I think we pretty much covered everything because mostly, like I said, I mostly just focused on gaming because that's kind of what it was supposed to be about. So that's that's mostly what I used it for. I will say, uh, side note, Caden, Caden Live, as much as I have problems with it, it actually worked flawlessly on the bar for some reason. I don't know why. Interesting. Okay. All right. So for me to answer those same questions, would I use it? Yes, actually, I would. I would have this on a, la on a laptop. But the qu my conundrum would come is like i've been doing a long-term review of blue bluefin and aurora which is the kd version of bluefin and the difference between those and this is that those are immutable or uh composable whatever you want to call them cloud native is what george castor i think we call them whatever the whatever the brand branding is today that's what those are right so that's the big difference between those and this. Obviously, those are more specifically for development and actual work. The Nabar is more for for gaming, but they're both Fedora based, and I like them both fairly equally because I don't do a lot of gaming. So I use I used sorry about the microphone. I was pressing a key. Uh, the um I I used Nobara basically like I was using Bluefin as a work thing right i was doing work i was messing around in genie i was doing basically the stu stuff that you talk about doing like you mess around in the browser you mess around in genie right that's you know you're not gonna spend a lot of time gaming like i did so uh, that's basically so i use them both the same so if i were to use a fedora based distro i'd choose either this or bluefin or aurora and that's where i'd have to kind of decide but i don't find anything horrible about this to the point where i wouldn't use it would i recommend it yeah i think i probably would if some, if I would say to those people who want, know they want to use Fedora, but don't want to have to mess around with setting Fedora up, this is the distro to use, right? I, I think that that's true. I think even over Bluefin and Aurora, which both have a ton of extra stuff installed with them and a lot of very opinionated ways of doing things, this is Fedora done like Fedora does it, but with the pain points of Fedora kind of uh, grinded about it off right it's very much much more smoother it has the codex it has uh supposedly at least better proprietary driver support for nvidia stuff now if they wanted better nvidia support maybe pop os is the answer but if they wanted to use fedora this would be better than vanilla fedora right so uh i i think that that's where i'd look is like if you're a f wanting to use fedora and you like i said you don't want those pain points this would be where i'd recommend that it, nabara for even if you're not a gamer, because you don't have to be a gamer to use it. It just does work better than vanilla Fedora does. The question is, does it maintain uh, updates as fast as Fedora does? Like, if you are, are, is 41 going to come as fast to this as it will vanilla Fedora? I don't think so. But we'll have to see. Probably not, because he's going to have to do that uh, custom kernel and stuff. So that's going to take him some time. Plus, I'm, I don't know if there's a team behind this or if it's just Glorious Egg Roll. So... There you go. The only other thing in terms of my notes that I wanted to say was that I really, because this uses ButterFS in the background, like Fedora does, 
But just like with Fedora, it doesn't have Snapper or Time Shift or any of that stuff. And that's just disappointing. Like if you're going to use ButterFS and then not set it up, that just is, is a complete missed opportunity. And that's one of my biggest complaints against Fedora. It does use the regular sub volume. So it uses at and at home. So you could use Time Shift without having to redo your sub volumes. I don't know that Fedora does that because Fedora at one point used at root FS as their their only sub volume. And Time Shift doesn't work with root FS uh, as, as a name. So I, I don't know if that's still the case. They might have changed. I haven't used Fedora in a couple of years. So and this at least has the right sub volumes, but uh, a missed opportunity in terms of not having Snapper or Time Shift. Like one or the other would have been fantastic. Like it just that should should be default and it didn't. That's, that's just disappointing. So uh, that was that. So. Uh, anything else for you guys to say on the bar or are we done? We're done. I actually have one correction to make. Uh, I actually went and looked it up because I remember them having a flat pack, but apparently the outlook for Linux has been taken down. It is now a snap, not a flat pack anymore. I don't know why, but whatever. <laughs> okay. Well, <laughs> that's, that is what it is, I guess. All right. So there you go, guys. Go. Let's go ahead and move on to the last part of the show, which is our Nuggies of the Week. Now, the Nuggies of the Week are the picks, tricks, and uh, software, whatever, things that we do. Uh, and basically what we're doing is we're taking things that we enjoy and sharing them with you guys. So those are the Nuggies of the Week. The name is still terrible, but whatever. Uh, Drew, your Nuggie of the Week, please. So I am a Nextcloud shill. No question about that. And I have talked about i don't know that i added as a nuggy of the week but i talked about custom menu uh, when we actually had our podcast on uh on nextcloud so custom menu came out with a version four within the last week or so maybe today i have no idea when because i just noticed that it was an, an update package custom menu inside nextcloud is very very good in terms of how to make your UI in Nextcloud look mo much more streamlined. And if you are a Nextcloud user and you don't necessarily like that like horizontal navigation where the, the letters for everything gets like jumbled up together, this custom menu is a vertical pop-out menu and you can eliminate that horizontal menu altogether. It is a very good application within the Nextcloud environment. And I have installed it for, you know, Matt's, <laughs> Matt's uh, Nextcloud for uh, files.thelinuxcast.org. And I think that the, I think that changing the UI uh, in Nextcloud is uh, not everybody does it, but everybody should really take a look at the features that they can, they can like massage to make things look much more pretty. Also, Grubbox theme, just adding a Grubbox theme just totally changes it. Like, makes it so much better. <laughs> you add Grubbox to anything, it makes it better. All right. Uh, uh, Nate, your Nuggie of the Week, please. My channel is kind of moving towards, and yes, there are some videos coming out. I've been writing notes like crazy. But my channel is kind of moving towards more hardware type stuff. And so I wanted to show a very nice little keyboard. It is a travel keyboard that's Bluetooth. And what I use it with is this big old honking stinking tablet that I paid too much money for, but it's nice to have a big screen. And it, what it is, is I got to look at the note to make sure I write it. I say it correctly it is the proto arc portable keyboard with touchpad. And the model number is the XK one. And what I like about it is a simple fact. It has a pretty decent battery on the inside of it, but it folds in a way that when you pull it out, all everything is right where it needs to be. And to have something like this, to especially for taking notes and stuff, and the fact that I have Samsung Dex, which is basically kind of like a desktop on an Android tablet, it's actually a pretty decent little typer. And it's very compact. The hinges, the only grip I have is that the hinges are on the outside, but still, it folds pretty well. That's pretty cool. And it's really nice. And... It, it's I think it's on sale for like 40 something dollars right now and it's usually I think close closer to 60 but yeah this is available on Amazon to buy and if you just want something to travel with it's I recommend it it's really really good nice okay so I have become drew and uh, my my nugget of the week is genie so I, I blame 
my new genie obsession on Drew 100%. This is all your fault. I will take it and <laughs> run with it. <laughs> because it is so good. It is just... Now, I don't know that I would call it the best text editor. I, I still love them. I will always have them as like the top because it's just it's just is is what it is. But in terms of GUI, this gives Kate a real run for its money when it comes to UI because it's much simpler, it's much prettier. Kate is kind of fugly out of the box. Now, Kate has more features because it's KDE because of course it does. But I will say that in terms of usage, I've enjoyed my time on Genie much more than I ever did Kate. And I used Kate for six months. Just in terms of actual usage, getting being able to customize everybody. It has the things that you want to customize, able to customize them. There's quite a few plugins that you can add. Uh, and it just works phenomenally well. I love the tabs. The way Drew has it set up and I've kind of copied is setting up the tree browser so you have your files there along the side all the time. I've been using the crap out of that. It's just so easy to go back and forth between files when you have that open. And it, I, it's not the best markdown editor that I've ever used. I will say that I'm, I can work with it. It's not horrible. It's not the worst. But there, it just doesn't do markdown as well as I'd like it to. So I'm, I'm going to try to explore on how I can fix that. But other than that, Genie is just so good, and it works well on non-GNOME distros. Like a lot of GTK stuff, if you want to use it, it kind of's got to be on on a on a GTK on on GNOME because if you want it to work as well as it possibly could, and you want it to look well, you know, GNOME is going to be probably the premier place to do that. Genie, not that big of a problem. You can just customize it with LX appearance, and it will use your GTK theme. There are themes there for the editing uh, space there that you can get on their website. There's no Grubbox theme, but Drew did me a Grubbox thing because he's an awesome, awesome person, and it's amazing. Um, so I've been doing that, and the themes are actually, from what I saw, I did a little bit on my own, Drew, before you sent that to me. Uh, the the theming was actually pretty easy. Like it's not it's not like um, overly hard. It's just a bunch of yeah. of color codes and stuff. You just gotta yep. kind of know, know where to put stuff and mess around with that stuff, right? So. Overall, Genie, very, very good, and I've just been having a kind of a ball with it, to be honest with you. It's just kind of been, been a lot of fun. It, it, it's a definite, it's, I knew if Matt gave it the shot with the, the tabs, the tabs are everything, guys. The tabs are everything for Matt. <laughs> yep. I, I, oh, by the way, let me count them right now. I'm just going to go look. I have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11. I have 14 tabs open right now. That's how many I had. Oh, okay. Which was like, because I think I had 46 open earlier. But that's because I was going through and doing the, the website, you know, and, and every time I clicked into a new page for an episode, it would open up a new tab. Uh, and so it, I got like 40 into it and then I have to close a whole bunch. So that, that's basically how I ended up with that many. But yeah, tabs are amazing. And it does side by side stuff too. So if you want to do a split view, you can do that. Uh, it's not quite as natural as you get in Vim or, or even in Kate really or, um, or Obsidian, but it's there and it works. So yeah, overall, very, very good. I haven't tried any coding in it yet. All I've been doing is writing. That's all I've been doing. So I want to do a little bit of coding in it later on. But other than that, it's a fantastic text editor. There you go. That's it for the Linux cast. And yes, uh, as, as Drew said, Tyler did show up. So he is, in fact, alive. Um, we've been able to verify that he still breathes. He just wasn't able to do the podcast today. But he did drop in and say hello. Uh, but yeah. There you go. That's the Linux cast. If you want to follow us or uh, get in contact with us, the best way to do so is via email. That's email at the linuxcast.org. There you probably the e that's the easiest way to get in contact with us. If you need to contact one of the guys here, you just send it to me and I'll forward on forward forward it on. Uh, you can find all of our contact information at the linuxcast.org slash contact. And also just to pimp out again, the linuxcast.org, uh, completely redone. May look exactly the same as it did before, but it's mostly done now, so go check that out as well. Uh, Drew has a YouTube channel. He is at youtube.com slash justaguylinux. There you'll find Debian tutorials uh, and Debian installs and window managers and Nextcloud and, and scripting and all sorts of awesome stuff. And we have a promised part two of Nextcloud video coming very soon. So make sure you head on over there, subscribe, and hit the bell notification for that as well. So do that. It's just a guy Linux on YouTube. Uh, Nate also has a YouTube channel, and I gonna you are Nate picks Tech World. You get it. 
Ha! It only took me three weeks. That's good. <laughs> All right, so here's youtube.com slash at Nate Picks Tech World. Links for that will be in the in the description below for Drew as well. Uh, make sure you head on over and subscribe to both of these fellows and give them a boost as well. So that's be really appreciated. If you want to support me on Patreon, you can do so. Patreon.com slash LinuxCast. Thanks to everybody who does support me over there on Patreon and YouTube and Kofi and all that stuff. I really do appreciate it. We record this live every Tuesday at 8 o'clock p.m. Eastern time. And uh, we have a lot of fun with the chat. I, I unfortunately didn't get to see very much of it this time because I had to move my notes over to its normal spot. So the chat was kind of hidden behind my microphone arms. So I apologize for not interacting with you guys as much as normal. But there you go. It's I, Nate, you need to send me a monitor. That's the only solution. I need three monitors. Obviously not enough. I need a couple more. Listen, as I tell Jake, you are not getting my monitors. <laughs> you have some to spare, you greedy. <laughs> uh, anyways, that's the Linux cast. Join us live. If not, you can always catch the recorded version that's out on Saturday evenings available on Podcatchers and on YouTube. Thanks, everybody, for watching, for listening. We'll see you next time. <laughs>